So I met you through Miles. Yes. Speaking of Miles, I just press record now for people who are hopping on. Um, and I was talking about how this microphone, if you're watching on YouTube, this mic's been around uh, for a long time since the beginning of this show. It, I think uh, I didn't film episode one because that was with Lonnie Waller and it was just, it was footage that we stole from my old TV show. But since episode two, this has been the mic. And uh, I was just saying to Ryan that uh, when I was podcasting Miles, I was breastfeeding Adelaide and trying to hide her, hide her face or hide my boob, I guess, behind this microphone. So, <laughs> so here, here we are. <laughs> That's like the definition of multitasking. I am sitting here fully dressed today. So um, sure. <laughs> lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let's talk about how we met. So I, when I worked at Meat Eater, Miles was my editor. And, oh, cool. um, and he was the one who suggested you. And I believe he said that you were one of the more, ta- one of the most talented writers that he knew and had a, a particularly interesting background because you, um, are a generational guide. Yes. Well, that's flattering. First of all, and miles, uh, I've worked with a fair number of editors, including your friend, friend, Sam, who's a great editor, but miles, miles actually shows you his edits. You know, and I, I sent him a piece that's in my book that I felt pretty good about and it was pretty clean and I'd revised it about 30 times and his edits were incredible. And a lot of times editors will accept a piece and then you're kind of hoping it gets in the magazine, the next issue and you see it and they don't really show you the edits that they do. You don't really learn anything from that process, but I kind of, I still have the word document that he sent me with his edits because it was like a, uh, like a masterclass in, in line edits. So yeah, no, I'm grateful that I got a chance to work with Miles. I think he's um, the only editor I haven't argued with. I mean, I don't actually argue, but I haven't debated sure. uh, changes with. He's he's on point. So agreed. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Right. Which gives you a lot it gives me a lot of confidence when I um when I send him a piece. But yeah, no, my my father grew up just outside New York City and he he moved to Maine in the late seventies. And he said that the two things he was looking for, he wanted to be able to take a leak off his front front porch and he wanted to be able to hunt without getting in his truck. And um, that was that was like the two requirements for his his new residence. So and then he got his guy, his master main guys license in the late 70s. And he did the striper stuff here in the Kennebec River back when it was really good before it before it kind of crashed. It crashed, I think, in like the 90s, um, the middle to later 90s. So I have all these photographs of him with his clients, you know, with these 40 pound striped bass caught in the middle of the day. And I, I, like, I, I missed it. I, I, I got here too late for that. So, um, yeah, but that was, that was, you know, he lived an hour, we lived an hour and a half North of the striper fishery, but he would go down there at four in the morning and come back late at late, late at night. Um, and that was kind of, that was my first exposure to the possibility of guiding yeah. And I'm going to pepper you with questions now, and this is going to be a slightly different format because usually I start with where you were born and raised, but I'm really interested in a little bit of the history before you were born. And then obviously we'll dive into, into your background. So is it, is it broad or broad? It's broad. Yeah. Broad. Broad. Okay. So yeah. you, was your dad a well-known guide? How did that all happen? Because he would have been quite early, right? Or was Maine already established as a guiding territory in the seventies? I think he may have started in the early eighties with the striper stuff. And I think there were a handful of guides on the South, like on the lower Kennebec river doing day trips, mostly. And I don't think many people fished at night at that point, you know, it was still, there was so the population of the, the migratory stripers were so strong that um, you could have a sustainable fishery with a handful of guides with just daytime fishing. A lot of it was like plug fishing and bait fishing. He didn't do a lot of fly stuff. Um, and there are bluefish too. There, he was just telling me about like acres of bunker down by the um, mouth of the Kennebec, and how his clients would complain about the fifteen pound bluefish because they were they were tired, their arms were tired, and they were like, "Well, when are we gonna?" You know, he would he would like go out on the near the ocean and it's slack tide and catch these fifteen pound bluefish. And um, I don't know if there's been a fifteen pound bluefish in in that area in a really long time. So, yeah, I think there were a handful of guys doing what he was doing. Um, he, he was doing a part-time, he was never a full-time guide. And I think he tired of, it was two things. I think he tired of just the bullshit with some of his clients. And I think he, once I kind of got of age where I became obsessed with fishing, which is around age nine or 10, 
I think he he um he didn't want to be away very much. And we fished together a lot. But you were he was able to support you growing up. And again, this is this is where we'll start to kind of um bring you into the picture here. So you were born to parents who at the time were together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, my mom was uh, a high school teacher and my dad was a clinical social worker. So he was like a counselor on the side. And then he did the guiding kind of on the side and in the summer times seasonally. Yeah. Gotcha. That makes sense. And then yeah. grow growing up, and I'm asking selfishly now, how did he keep you interested in fishing? Because my daughter is over it now. She wants to row. She wants to do archery. But if I love fishing, she no longer wants to do fishing. If I love hunting, she doesn't want to go hunting. It's almost, she's six and she's rebelling. Help, help me. <laughs> I bet it's just a phase. I bet you when yeah. she's like 12, 13 or 14, she'll like come back around. That's my guess. I'm just like, I want to put that out there. Did you go um, through a phase? Did you, do you remember your, your first fishing memory and how it all unfolded? His parents, so my dad's parents bought a camp, um, on the Serpentine River in Central Maine, which is like a, it's like a bog. But I feel like as a kid, your first experience fishing has a kind of a mystical quality to it. So if you, if anyone, you know, went to this place now, you'd look at it and think it's full of milfoil and, and, and duckweed. It's not the uh, prettiest water, but um, yeah, my grandparents were there from May through September and I would stay on their dock. And my grandmother who was this like four foot 10 Polish woman. Um, would like call at me to come in for dinner and I would refuse to come in because I, you know, I'd like chuck my bobber out there as far as I possibly could and just be fixated on it for hours. And she would, um, she had this little bell that she would ring to, <laughs> to try to get my attention and I would just ignore it as long as I possibly could. <laughs> that sounds about right. I think my husband's still the same. Right. I never went through a phase of like, um, you know, I'm going to take a step back from fishing. It's just, it's actually been like an acceleration from that point. And then when I was like 10 or 12, my dad introduced me to fly fishing and he had never had formal training. He was, he never like worked with a casting instructor. His father was not someone who he spent a lot of time with growing up. Um, so he had taught himself to fly cast. And if you see him fly cast, even now you would, you would think, okay, it's not pretty, but he's like very effective. You know, he's, he, even at almost 80 years old, like he'll get the fly where it needs to be. Um, and when I when I realized that that was a possibility that that these at this time in the Kennebec these three to five pound brown trout would eat these tiny little flies in the evening, uh, that was it. That was all. So yeah. did you did you also want to be a guide? Where was your head at as far as looking toward your future? Oh, that's a really good question. I, well, I wanted to be a basketball player at first, and that are, didn't. Really... Are you tall? You look tall. Yeah, I'm like six, almost. I'm six five and a half or so. Um, gotcha. Yeah, which is weird because my dad's like five eight, and my mom's five seven, and my grandmother's four ten. So I don't, I, I'm not sure what happened, but um, I've kind of bounced around. I mean, I think I, I never, I never leaned towards guiding as a full time thing. I've always been interested in um, storytelling and writing, um, and and teaching. I think too was always in the back of my mind to some extent. I, I honestly didn't really know what I wanted to do when I was a teenager. Um, but I thought I, I think I saw that my dad used it as sort of a supplemental way to to make some money, but also um, to just to stay in the game, you know. And to um, he had relationships with some of his clients that 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 really mattered to him. Um, so it was never like I want to quit everything and become a fishing guide. It was I love fishing so much, and I love the shared experience, particularly with people who are developing, and you haven't had as much opportunity as me i love i love being in the back of the skiff i love being in the back of the canoe i love watching someone line something up for the first time and like see how they how they their recognition of of what what's possible for them um and i'm at the point now where i've fished so much that 99 percent of the time when i'm fishing for friends like not I'm fishing with friends not guiding i'm in the back or i'm i'm pulling my skiff like i'm not um we're not casting at the same time, like seeing him who, you know, catches more fish. I like watching the setup and and my dad and I fished exclusively from a canoe and he would always be in back and he would always like position me for the cast. He would always be the, the net man. And we've kind of like switched roles at this point. And I, he's very stubborn about it, but I kind of insist that he goes in front of the canoe now. 
um, so I can I can paddle them around a little bit. Yeah, I think that's fair. Is that a real East Coast thing? Mm -hmm. um, I've never fished in Maine, but have fished New Brunswick and and have fished a little bit back east in other areas in Canada. Is Maine very yeah. similar to to that sort of culture and history? Can you do you know anything about the history over there when it comes to not stripers? We'll get into stripers in a minute, but maybe to some of the salmon yeah. and trout. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. I think it's a tradition with Maine guides to have like these old town canoes. A lot of main guides had these larger canoes that they could um, put like a small outboard on and do like trolling during the day and fly casting at night. But I think it is part of the cultural identity, especially on the northern rivers. Um, there were guides that would pull, like have these long sticks and actually pull down these shallower parts of rivers. Um, and I think accessibility wise, and it is interesting that you mentioned that culturally drift boats are less common here. We have some for sure but you'll see more canoes on the rivers and more people waiting on the rivers. Um, so yeah, I think it's more of like the main identity kind of thing and the history of the main guide and that you see these old photographs of, of people up at um, Upper Dam on the, on the um, near Moose Lake McGuntic in these canoes anchored up with their early, you know, er very early days of guiding. Um, so I think it's because, I think the canoe itself is part of the, it's part of the main tradition with with main early main guides, and it's just sort of stuck around. Is sam yeah. are salmon Atlantic salmon specifically still a major part of the fishery in Maine? They are endangered, and they're not. You're not allowed to fish for them recreationally. So there, there's um, there's a big push in Maine to with dam removals, as there is obviously everywhere. Uh, but this Atlantic salmon numbers have have been pretty miserable for a long time. And that fishery, you know, up on the Penobscot in particular, I think the last recreational fishing was in the 80s, early 80s, before they closed it. So it's been a really long time. I didn't know um, that. So the, yeah, so there is no recreational fishing for land. There's landlocked salmon, which they're um, are plentiful and they're great fun um, on a fly rod. But yeah, the Atlantic salmon, that's another thing I wish I had been around for. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's a little bit sad, but uh, there's, there's efforts in, in, place now to sort of reseed the rivers and see if fish will come back uh and trying to get dam dams removed but um yeah i mean people are, are optimistic but it, i don't think the numbers have significantly increased i'm gonna look real stupid here but i, I don't care so okay. like to topher brown i always thought he was fishing in me where is the sault st marie which which where is that Saint Marie, i think it's like sault st marie i think is like upper peninsula michigan Oh, so that's not the one I'm thinking of. There's a fishery somewhere in the main region or in a bordering state that has got Atlantic salmon that they were still fishing uh -oh. for 15 years ago. Where is that? Yeah, it's in Canada. Um, the Miramichi, is that what it is? Oh, that would be New Brunswick. I mean, a yes, it's short answer is yes. But I thought there was one in America. Very possible. I'm not sure. I'll have to Good have a question. look into it. Let's talk about stripers. Is was yeah. there con controversy from a conservation stance? And I know we're going in deep here. This is again not usually my my format, but um, was there controversy with the stripers and the salmon like we've had in Canada, in Eastern Canada? Oh, interesting. I think because both um, both populations have been returning to Maine forever, that hasn't been an issue. I know the striper numbers, the, the striper, the return of like mature stripers in Maine is is way, way down. There's still a pretty good fishery in southern Maine, like Saco Bay area, and in, even up to the Kennebec at sometimes. But they've been coexisting for so long that I don't think that's as much like you like you set up in the Miramichi and other parts in Canada for a bunch of different reasons, right? A bu bunch of different shifts. The striped bass are um, kind of infiltrating areas that were historically just Atlantic salmon. Um, but that's not not so much the case in Maine because they've both been returning here for thousands of years. Okay, and I yeah. I, I want I I know nothing about stripers. I've never caught one, so I'm going to have uh, questions for you later. We'll come back to those. Yeah. Coming yeah, back just to you. transparent. Um, stri I, stripers hate me. I, uh, yeah, I have a very interesting relationship with striped bass. Um, I'm happy to answer as much as I can, <laughs> but I may not, I may not be the striped bass guy. My oh. friends would reiterate that what are you what did you guide for yeah no, no for sure um i mean i i guide for uh pike northern pike and musky oh. and um, 
and 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 salmon and trout bass i've also like got, we have uh maine has a tidal carp population uh -huh. um and they're you know they're like 10 to 15 pounds they tail they mud like bonefish uh and very few people fish for them so i've become obsessed with carp and I all my friends saw that fishing. in your book yeah. you had a, a dig yeah. in that and it was yeah. You had mentioned the carp alongside another species. I can't remember what it was, but you had sort of a dig about it being the best that there is. And I couldn't tell if you meant the carp or the other fish. Were you referring to the carp? I'm referring to the carp. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, I've been fishing for them for like six summers as hard as I can. I think I've caught like maybe 13 or 14, something like that. I think they're incredibly difficult. Um, and I'm fishing in like a technical pulling skiff. They're in two feet of water and they act like permit. They don't, they do not respond. Um, honestly to a fly and uh it's sight fishing and it's yeah they're like big backcountry redfish that don't eat flies <laughs> and i'm kind of obsessed with them yeah okay so let's get back to you in high school did you know yeah, sure. early on that you wanted to be a writer yeah yeah i mean i think i think i've always been interested in storytelling i wrote like really bad poems in elementary school the school um librarian whose name i can't think of hope she forgives me she told me after, like at the end of sixth grade when I was graduating she gave me like a a book of Robert Frost poems and said like I think you're going to be a writer and I was like okay yeah that's nice that's great um yeah I think I've always been drawn to stories and you know I've been doing a lot of readings around Maine talking about my book reading from my book and people are asking like what what pulls you to this like why do you write about these experiences you know and the best the best explanation I have is that I feel like on some level, whether it's conscious or not, I feel like I'm trying to build a kind of a catalog of memories, particularly with my father and other people that I know won't be around forever. So that, um, well, you know, there are like these these images and these moments that you have on every fishing trip that you return to, right? And they they stay with you, and um. I guess that I guess I could say I'm I'm someone who does tend to like revisit those things like those moments that like the first time I, I caught a tarp and the the moments that your mind can't quite grasp in the moment when I'm able to write about those things I feel like it's a kind of catalog that I can return to and people I care about can return to people who have had similar experiences will read it and hopefully have a kind of parallel memory they're like reading my story but also having the experience of of thinking about a particular moment um in their in their path you know so i think it, it's it's also like a way for me to go fishing again right it's a way for me to go hunting again because good writing is 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 being like hyper present in that memory in that moment and and like taking these images from my life and like putting them in the reader's brain and saying like here i want you to look at this and um you know just like i think angling is very intentional or choices are very intentional that's that's there's a parallel there with with writing um yeah it's a long answer no no it's good and i will say um because look i obviously podcast a lot of authors and so it would mm. be very difficult for me to try to get through everyone's book but i'm really annoyed at myself that i started yours so late because mm. i'm genuinely invested i'm fully invested i need to get a paper copy because this the computer is great but i, I like want to sit down with a cup of coffee in the morning and read um yeah. you are a fantastic writer so let's lead up to this um because obviously i want to share all the details of your book but i still mm -hmm. need to get back to young uh, ryan yeah, 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 wrote here yeah. okay yeah. so you graduate what's the plan when you graduate high school the plan is to go play college basketball with a small dinky three d3 school um, I was going to be, I really wanted to do journalism. I think I want, I was interested in sports journalism at that time. I've always been, baseball was my first love. Fishing was my second love. The baseball narrative crashed quite early when I screwed up my pitching arm. Mm -hmm. Um, so after high school, it was like, okay, I'm going to continue this path. I, I, I got really tall. Like I, I was good at basketball I'm not like D one good, but I was like D three good. <laughs> uh, you know. And then it's hard to it's hard to look back at choices we make in college and think, here I am at here I was at like eighteen making this decision that would have tremendous impact on the rest of my life, and I wish I could go back to eighteen year old Ryan and be like Ryan, why did you go to school, in like 
Maryland. Why don't you go? You should have gone to like Montana or Idaho or, you know, or something like that. So I went to school Why? for basketball. Why would you have Why? gone? Yeah. Well, I just, I, I, I think I was kind of fixed it on the basketball piece. And I thought that if, if that went well, it would, it would cover up the reality of like not being able to do these outdoor things that I, that like make me feel like myself. Right. Um, I was like right outside Baltimore. Um, I was like probably a little depressed as well at that time. And I think in part because I was in this new environment, the basketball thing didn't work out. I really hated it. I hated the um, the way it it took over my life. Um, I really, I don't think I fished my whole freshman year of college, which was difficult. Um, and I met some lovely people, friend, people I'm still friends with, but I, I didn't find my people, if that makes sense, right? Yep. Like I didn't, I did not find them there. Um, so it's been kind of, I transferred, I went to UMaine Orono, which was like a little bit better. I did social work, which is what my dad and sister have done. Um, I worked in the mental health field for 10 years after college, mm -hmm. which was rewarding and also extremely stressful. And at that point I decided that I wanted to go back to grad school for writing. And I did that. Um, really chasing the money, you know, social work, social work and writing. Um, Baller. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I'm thinking about retiring soon. No. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I got back to the writing. Um, my, you know, elementary school librarian was right. Yeah. And, and I think um, I, when I went to graduate school for writing, it was the best two years of school of my life. I, my first semester mentor was Rick Bass, who's a well-known writer from Montana. And um, it was incredibly intimidating to work with him and totally kicked my ass, but um, but helped me mold a few of the stories that are in the book and helped just kind of give me the confidence that this is something that I can do. Um, and from there, I got into teaching and I teach writing now. And that's I, I, I'm absolutely in love with my job. My students are amazing. Um, and honestly, I've been thinking about this because I, I'm an adjunct and like I'm I'm poor and Miles can attest to that, like what that's like as an adjunct, like the grind of not having what you need, but loving the work. I was thinking if I if I had like full time teaching and I guided in the summers and I would continue to publish like those three things, I'm good. I would be a very happy person for the rest of my life. But isn't that is that what you have now? Um, I, I teach, but I don't, if I have like full time, I'm a, I'm an adjunct. So like, I don't have much, I don't, I don't make much money. I don't have like full-time benefits, even though I'm like basically doing the same work yeah. that faculty do. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's more about the financial part than, than it is the actually what I'm doing now, but yeah, yeah. That's, that's sort of like, that's the goal. That's the aim is that kind of triangle of publishing, guiding and teaching. I feel again like an idiot because I have no idea what an adjunct is. So what is that? Is that short for something? It's short for exploitation. Um <laughs> so adjunct is like a a contracted professor. They basically are like, okay, we need we need someone to teach these few classes. We're gonna pay you like an incredibly low amount of money. You're not gonna get uh you, this is not about tenure. You're not this is not like a track for you to get full time work here. It's not a guarantee of anything other than these two or three classes on the contract. Um, you don't get benefits. Uh, you're not part of the faculty. In fact, you're kind of invisible to the faculty. So it's 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 sort of like it's cheap labor for universities. So um, it's a subcontractor at a really low rate. That's correct. That's correct. And I think a lot of and uh, in this is happening all over the country. The adjunct is kind of a cliche. <clears throat> They come in and they kind of parachute in and they teach and then they leave and they're they're very much invisible to their faculty. I I'm I'm not there because I have strong connections with faculty. I'm there because of the students and they're incredible. Um, essentially, it's like a job in which you can go and work really hard and no one's watching. I actually had a conversation with my boss about this today, in which I was not quite happy. But but I I don't. I'm I'm not complaining about the work. Like I love the work. I get to talk about writing all day. I get to read these students' essays. I get to hear them read aloud in front of a crowd of people that they've never done before. Um, yeah, and there there is I think <clears throat> part of this 
process with the book too is had a chance to reflect on it because you're so close to it for so long you can't really see it and then you and then after a while you can is like these these obsessions like these these like patterns of returning to places every season for particular things this experience of like teaching for no money because i love it um they're like consequences of that right the consequences that are i i, ha I don't have any i don't have like savings um I save up all of my extra money to go tarpon fishing two days a year. Um, I have to like buy my own health insurance. I um, don't own a home, you know, and I'm in my late thirties. And and I like I I was thinking about that the other day. Like, would I would I change that? I'd like to have like more stability, but it's a kind of lifestyle, and I think the book is is the product of that, right? And I'm not going to get rich or famous from this book, but it's me, you know, and there has to be like a level of acceptance that um, these are the things that you love to do. These are the people you choose to spend your time with. And as I've gotten older, I've gotten far more selective about who I spend time with, right? Like, is it, I, I think when you're a kid and you're fishing, you think, oh my God, I have all this time. This is incredible. I have all these years to look forward to, right? And then you get into your 20s and things speed up and you get into your 30s and all your friends are getting married and having kids. And you realize oh yeah, this is very limited. This is very fleeting. Like, what am I going to do at this time? You know, and this is what I want to do. Yeah. How did all this start? What came first, the guiding or the teaching? I was guiding uh, in my early twenties, part-time. Um, I was doing a lot of like smallmouth bass fly fishing trips, a lot of trout trips and pike trips. I do a lot of pike fly fishing in this shallow water, which I love. Um, you know, and all the work is, all the work, the the guiding and the mental health crisis work that I was doing and teaching it's, it's like the thing that I didn't have in college is, was connection. It was like genuine connection with people that I wanted to spend time with. Right. And it sounds like very simple, but I feel like moving towards connection, that's sort of what the relationships in the book are about. Um, the connection you have with a client having like a great day together, even if the fishing isn't great, a connection I have with a, with a client that I'm, assessing who's having a mental health crisis the connection i have with my student who writes this like amazing beautiful vulnerable essay and reads it in front of class and everyone's like tearing up including myself like i love that stuff i love like those moments where you feel like um you're having a genuine connection with people i don't i don't like in our world that doesn't seem to happen very often organically and those are like three venues where i feel like i'm able to have that connection with people I mentioned earlier that I met you through Miles and I didn't give any context. And, and I was writing an article about guiding. And if this, or I was writing a five-part series on whether becoming a fishing guide was a decision that um, that someone might want to make. And when I had finished writing the series, I turned it into a uh, podcast. You can find the podcast on this on Anchor. And I think it's called So You Want to Be a Fishing Guide. And then also put it on YouTube. And I can hear your voice now and I think I can remember what, because I, I had you send me an audio snippet, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, I of you yeah. reading your part. And and I think I remember, now that I can put a face to it, now that we're sitting here and we've got a little bit of moment or time, a short yeah. bit of time to get to know each other. I'm going to be kind of brazen here and ask you something, even though admittedly I have not listened to the audio clip in a while, but it's something just resonating. I thought I remembered hearing a little bit it wasn't sadness, but there was something off in that it was, I don't know if it was almost like a defiance, but your mm. tone was slightly different than the rest. And, oh, I'm, interesting. and I'm wondering if, oh, if, if, if there's anything more to it, you know, with your, I think I recall your snippet was something about how, yeah, life is too short to be spending time with people that you don't like. Um, yeah. and I'm just wondering if you're feeling a little bit of, of pushback, I feel like there's a bit of pushback in you now. I mean, I hope that you go in, you know, all blazing talking to your bot, your boss or whoever, whomever manager, whatever they're called yeah. to, um, yeah. to go to full-time, but are, is there a little bit of defiance that's finally starting to kettle up? Like, are you reaching a breaking point? Yes. Yes, I am. And, and, and that was my conversation with my boss earlier is feeling like, the conflict is we we find these things that we love to do and then we realize that those things may not sustain us in the world that we're in 
in certain ways, right? Like it may not provide stability mm -hmm. or um, the adult things that we're supposed to have. I mean, I think my the clip about um, who we spend our time with is like thinking about the plethora of guiding experiences I've had from like absolutely wonderful to a drunk guy stepping in my canoe and flipping us over in the middle of the river, you know, just, just like a wide range of experiences. And every time I take someone to one of these places that I'm obsessed with, that I love, that I return to in different seasons, it's, it's kind of a vulnerable thing because you're paying me to go to this place that I'm, I'm familiar with, that I know intimately, and I'm showing it to you. And I'm like, I'm bringing you into that place. And I don't want to do that with someone who um, just because they're paying me, just because they're like, oh, yeah, you're like, you're the guy that you're the carp guy, you're the smallmouth guy, you're the you're the pike guy, I see. Um, and I think that that mentality also comes from, you know, a lot of the book is my obsession with tarpon fishing and and the recognition that tarpon fishing in the Keys is a very exclusive sport. Right. And um a lot of the people that go down there and hire guides for 30 or 40 or 60 days a year, they make a lot of money and they have expendable income and that's wonderful for them. Um, but I also know from knowing guides down there that they're, they've, they've had to chisel out a business in a place where there are tons of guides dealing with people who have really high expectations, a lot of money, right? A lot of power in their jobs. And they've had to sort of like take them back down to earth and say, actually, you have a tailing loop and your casting sucks, right? And here's this person who's making $2 million a year who like doesn't want to hear from the guide about how bad the casting is, right? So I think that for them, it's like the process of whittling down who are the clients that I want to work with who are able to do this. Um, and my guide who I write about in the in the, in the the book has, has like, he lets me stay with him when I come down there because he knows I'm kind of broke. Um, I pay him, obviously I pay him. Honestly, I don't really know what he charges because like the last couple of years, he just like doesn't tell me. I just pay him as much as I can. We're cool with that. He's cool with that. Um, and I like send him flies and maple syrup and like try to <laughs> try to like make up for the fact that I don't I can't like tip him a, a like a an Audi or something. Um, <laughs> are you sure? You're, <laughs> are you sure you're not Canadian? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm close. I'm not. Uh, yeah, I mean, a couple hundred miles south. So, yeah, I mean, I there's no amount of money that you can pay me to to spend time with someone that I don't want to show these places that are so so um important to me. And and I have I have clients that, that I that I still see that um that I love being around. And that's I would rather be broke than than like spend a canoe is a very small space for eight hours with someone you don't want to be with, you know? Um the same thing with a skiff, right? And everything changes when you when you develop a relationship and you see someone year after year um, and it's about the fishing, but it's also like you have a day to catch up and to ask them about their kids and um, tell them about the book, you know, and just like talk as humans who are like unplugged from their jobs for, for six hours, like sharing this goal of trying to, you know, trying to hook a giant pike in shallow water on a fly. Is there a species that helps to kind of, um, what's the word to, to kind of mend any issues or is there a species that kind of fills the void, something that brings everyone together? It doesn't matter if they're a dickhead or if they're a newbie or if they're wonderful, just something that is kind of the, a one fits all species that works for you. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, Maine has some of the best smallmouth bass fishing. And the smallmouth bass is like, it's not a particularly sexy fish, but they're incredibly forgiving. It's a great fish for beginning and intermediate anglers because they eat the shit out of flies. They will let you screw up and probably eat the fly again on the same cast. Um, they fight great. They jump. Um, they'll eat top water. They'll eat stuff off the bottom. They'll eat everything. And they're big, you know, and if they grew to 50 pounds, I probably wouldn't fish for anything else. Right. I mean, they're incredible fish. Um, so that is one fish. There's, there's something like gritty about, and, and I, I like that about smallmouth. Like they live in, places where um the other fish couldn't live and there's like a kind of toughness about them that i respect in a way 
And I, I've had anglers who are like blue, blue ribbon trout guys who are like, yeah, you know, I guess I've heard smallmouth fishing is really good. I mean, let's give it a shot. And they're like, well, okay. Yeah, this is, this is interesting. You know, this is interesting. Like this thing's like pulling into my backing on a, on a seven weight in the, on a, in this river with really strong current. Um, and I've also, I, there's something, I think bass in general, it's oftentimes the fish that, that people start with. So you see that come full circle when I guide, like I had this guy several years ago who was probably in his late seventies, early eighties and, um, comes from a, f a family of anglers and he, he wanted to bass fish and he's been, he's been all over the world. He's done permit fishing and, and tarpon fishing, et cetera, et cetera. And I could just see him kind of like getting into this level of comfort bass fishing, the smallmouth fishing and how much he loved it, which is like, you can find smallmouth, I think pretty much everywhere. Right. You don't have to go to, um, the far ends of the of the earth they're kind of like a blue collar fish you know and they i love this i love those things they definitely bring people together in the sense of there's like a respect i think among anglers and and these fish um yeah and they've they've saved so many days for me oh my god i love those things <laughs> <laughs> how do you guide out of a canoe i've recently started fishing out of a canoe and i i find it terribly unenjoyable and I want to know what I'm doing wrong. You're really, you're really selling my business, April. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> how do you do it? How do you how do you cast? Do you have swivel chairs? What do I need to do to make my experience better? Yeah, you need to get a guide who has a drift boat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, part of it's maneuverability, and I can get in really shallow water, and I can I can like pretty much stop the the vessel in place. Um, yeah, I think the tricky thing, right, is if you're if you're sitting kind of low to the water, stripping is hard, right? Because you're you can strip and you're like stripping right into the seat of the canoe. So um I'll have some clients will like kneel. I'll put like a um like a throw pad on the bottom of the canoe and they'll kind of kneel and they'll have a little bit of space to throw the loose line between their legs, between their knees, and they can cast and they have a little more distance to strip. But idea. I also Yeah, I also fish um people who stand up and that um there's some there's a photo of that in the book my friend parker who's in the book quite a lot he and i um have kind of perfected that and we're not we're not sight fishing but there's one angler in front and he's standing and he's you know he's like five foot six and i'm six foot five so i'm better in the in the back of the canoe in that situation or else but it's it's like it's the same thing that my dad did one person in the back lining up the shots positioning the canoe Another person I have, I've had some clients who I feel comfortable standing in the, in the canoe going through a rapidly moving river and other people, I do not want them to stand up, you know? Um, but there, there are ways, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll drop anchor in certain pools and that helps people feel more comfortable. Um, I think it just comes, I think the the toughest thing is when you're on a skiff, you have more ability to use your lower body, you know, to cast and to kind of brace yourself and to create more kind of line speed. Uh, and when you're sitting in a canoe, it's it's entirely upper body, right? So um, it actually forces you to slow down because if you don't, then you're going to be slapping the water on both sides. Um, so in a way, like that's how I grew up fly fishing was sitting in the front of a canoe, right? Being very aware of um, the canoe's movements and angles and positioning. And when I guide, it's the same thing. And I And I've, you have to you have to work with different clients to figure out what works for them because there, there's no there's no resolution to the fact that like canoes are not super comfortable after like three hours right so part of my day is like i need to figure out places where i can stop and get out people yeah. can walk around stretch, take some shots waiting get back in try try something totally different um but you also like i think in a canoe you feel very much like you're almost you're like you're like in the river in, in a drift boat it's more comfortable for sure uh you, you're a little more elevated you can stand but there's something about a canoe that feels more intimate to me you, you i just feel more connected to the to the environment that i'm in um and it, it's really versatile i think uh it's a great way to fish dry flies as well yeah but again yeah it's not maybe not the best uh situation for like a six hour drift with a with a 70 year old, but, um, I've made it work. Yeah. What about carp? Do you fish for carp out of a canoe? No. So I have, a um, my dad and I went in on a skiff. It's like a 16 foot, um, shallow water skiff. 
that I fish out of for carp in Mary Meeting Bay. It's the only place where we have carp in Maine. They were they were put there in the late 1800s by European settlers as like a food source. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why. I mean, maybe because they're so durable, they could bring them over and they knew they'd survive. But um, uh, it's, it sounds to me, I, I've not done a lot of permit fishing, but successful carp fishing for me has come mostly from wading. So I've caught some fish from the skiff, but a lot of times it's um, there are particular flats where they're, um, they'll tail and they'll mud. And um, God, they're so spooky. They, they act like fish that are pressured every day. And in the five or six years of fishing for them, I've seen one other person fishing. So they're not being pressured for the most part. Um, but something about stealth, and I, I think I'm screwing up. There's something I'm doing with, with polling, with the skiff. There's something that that's tipping them off. And I don't know what it is yet. It's my own stupidity, but there's something, um, if I get out, if I can get out or have my client or friend get out, um, it just the success rate is way higher. I think it has to do with, with the noise level, with, um, just the level of stealth too. And some of the flats are kind of gnarly to walk through. They're pretty muddy and pretty, pretty, I've lost some tennis shoes in one of the, we call one of the flats tennis shoe flat because I literally the suction pulled two tennis shoes off my feet. Um, they're still there. I'm sure. I don't feel good about that, but um, yeah, I think a canoe would be too difficult. Uh, and it, with the skiff, I'm, you know, being six, five and then being up on a polling platform on a good vis, a good vis day, I can see them a long ways away um, yeah. and set people up. Yeah. And are they usually in groups of two, five solo? Yeah. Um, it really depends. Uh I've seen a mix. You don't see them in giant groups. It's usually three or four or less. And a lot of times when they're feeding, it's a single or a pair. And um, yeah, I mean, I've seen fish that were well over 20 pounds. Um, I haven't caught those ones yet, but I've caught fish over 14 pounds. And um, yeah, I mean, they uh, they blend in pretty well. And in the high tide in Maine and Merrimian Bay, they go up in the um, there's like these wild rice um things and they'll go and kind of float in those grasses you'll just Wait. see them kind of floating in there like like yeah. laid up yeah what do you mean what do you mean high tide is this tidal influenced yeah, yeah it's tidal yeah it's Maine bay so the only the only um the only carp fishery that maine has is tidal so and they're not it's kind of brackish water it's not full salt water i don't think i don't know if i don't think carp can survive salt although i'm, I'm not entirely sure about that so it's like mostly fresh water um, but yeah, it's tidal. So I think most people, they think of carp, they think of like a little pond behind a Walmart or something. And that's cool. Um, and they're in rivers, right? And and that kind of thing. Um, and lakes, obviously in the Great Lakes, there's some giant ones. Yeah, but these are these are tidal and um, the feeding windows are really narrow. So like last 45 minutes of the outgoing tide is when they like really push and mud and tail. So it creates that sort of saltwater flats environment, you know, and yeah. you have the pressure of the ticking clock because you know at low tide you're kind of done um yeah what are they yeah. feeding on is it still nymphs or could you throw a little shrimp and stuff in them in there at them there's a bunch of there's a bunch of worms like these little tiny red worms i'm giving away all my secrets tiny little red worms they eat mollusks too um i have not caught them on nymphs the only thing i've caught them on is like a heavy weighted fly and um you know you see these videos of guys that like throw Guys and gals will throw way past the fish and like drag it over their head and then drop it. Um, I haven't had a ton of success with that. Um, but most mostly I'm just throwing so they can see the fly kind of falling. And if they see it falling without it plunking them on the head, um, they tend to respond pretty well. If you throw at one that's like floating in the in the grass, they will not eat it. If someone knows that, please let me know. Uh you want the ones that are like bulldozing their head is in the mud, you know, on the outgoing tide, you'll see a, a, you'll see the mud that's like 30 yards long because the tide is pulling the mud out and it's, you, you, they can't really hide when they're doing that. Um, but yeah, they're incredibly spooky fish. Um, I wish the, the feeding window was a little longer because it gets a little stressful because you know, you have, you have an hour basically to yeah. get it done Yeah. <laughs> each day. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So it's like, yeah. Yeah. But you mentioned earlier uh stripers in the dark, which is actually something I yeah. didn't I did not know that was a thing. 
Are there mm. other species that have the same that, that you also fish for in the dark? Can you do you fish for carp in the dark? Can you? I don't know about carp. I mean, I tarpon fish a lot in the dark. Yes, for sure, a lot. Um, yeah, and that's like when all the guides are not there. I mean, striper is brown trout. I know. I know that there are some guys who um, who fish brook trout a particular way at night. I've never done that before. I've tried mousing for browns uh, at night, and I've had some success with that. I know some guys who have tried that with rainbows, with less success. Um, I've tried ice fishing for pike at night. No, no luck. I know a few people who have caught pike at like nine thirty at night, um, and a few people who have caught musky uh, from a from a boat at night. Um, but I've not had any success doing that. So I don't. I don't know. I mean, carp. Um, their eyesight sucks. They they smell and they kind of like feel around with those little the barbule things on their on their chin. So I don't I don't it's a good question. I don't know. That would that would open things up a little bit. I wonder what they do at night. I wonder if anyone snorkels yeah. with carp. You know how we snorkel with trout and salmon and steelhead. Do they do it with <laughs> carp? <laughs> they should if they don't. Yeah. But you tend to live in like kind of murky stuff. So I bet the viz is not hard great. To see. For, hard to see. Yeah. You gotta be really up close to them to to see them. Um but yeah, I love I love those things. And I know they're invasive. They've been here since 18 something, but um they haven't moved anywhere. That's like they they have not been, you know, dropped anywhere else by people, which is good. And some people, I think some locals on the rivers where they where they are uh in Mary Mean Bay kind of get kind of upset because when they're feeding, there's a lot of silt and the river gets kind of cloudy at times. And I I hear that. And also I love them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how, how how long have you been? You're you're almost 40 now, I think I read. Yeah. 30. I'm 39 until the um 30th of this month. So yeah, I'm barely hanging on to my 30s. I think you're gonna really enjoy your 40s personally. <laughs> okay. What do what what should I what should I do first of all? What should I look forward to, do you think? Well, I'm new. I'm I'm only 41. Okay. Well, congratulations. Thank you. And it's my favorite era so far. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's because a, I just, I finally have realized what is the most important thing to me and that's time. Yeah. Um, B, I thought that I was suddenly going to become fat and awful at 40. And so I put in a lot of work to be fit. I'm fitter now. I am more fit now than I have ever been, including wow. in my, in my twenties. Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm a little more respected maybe because I'm a little bit older but mostly I'm just very validated in my decisions to decide that I don't have time for X, Y, Z, and I do have time for ABC. And, um, and when I, I'm, when I make the decision to do or not do something, I trust myself because I've got, you know, experience and I don't know, like, I'm sure the fifties are great too, but <laughs> the forties, yeah. I thought we're going to be just this scary, horrible, old yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. great. What a time to be alive. That's so yeah. good to hear. Thank you. I needed to hear that. I definitely I, needed to. I will bet. I will bet you. Uh even we can even put a dollar on this if you'd like. I will bet you that you I can, afford, I can afford that bet. Especially seeing you percolate and just seeing watching you. And I don't know you, but I, I like to think that I can <laughs> I can just read people a little bit. Yeah. I bet you, you wrote that book partly. I bet you a bit of that has made you feel like you've taken control of your life. And I bet you, you go into four, into 40 now, not afraid to speak your mind. Um, you do it very well. And I think that you're going to grab life by the balls <laughs> and you won't be an adjunct for much longer. That's my personal yeah. opinion. That's my little, my little fortune teller vibe. I really, I appreciate that. And I, I will do everything I can to make that true. So, so you've been guiding then for say close to 20 years at some soon enough, it'll be close to 20 years. How many days a week do you guide and how much longer do you think you will be guiding for? That's a good question. I mean, there've been some years where I haven't guided at all. And some years where I'll guide a couple of times a month in the summer. Um, I mean, I have right now, I have like four or five trips in the spring, mostly pike stuff, some smallmouth stuff. I'm working on getting my captain's license because technically the carp fishing it's title. So you need a captain's license to guide there. So I'm in the process of that process there. Um, I don't, you know, I would like to continue guiding. I would like to do the captain's, get the captain's license and really develop the carp fishery. There's only a few guys doing it. I think one other guy really. Um, 
it, it allows me to, it allows me to like explore things. It allows me to sort of like sharpen my craft too. I'm also like an obsessive fly tire and I tie for SS flies, which is like a, a great fly tying company in Maine. And, um, I love guiding too, because it's like a, uh, a testing facility for my flies. <laughs> right. And I love that process of developing something and, and having someone throw it and having it work. That's very satisfying too. Yeah. yeah. What, what about this book? Um, talk to me a little bit about the title and, and where people can find it. Is it out for release yet? Oh yeah. Yeah. So it came out, um, in the fall. So it came out in late 2023. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's called tributaries essays from woods and waters. And it's a collection of outdoor essays that I would say it's sort of focusing on um, male relationships, in particular, my relationship with my father, my relationship with one of my best friends, Parker, who's like my fishing buddy, and my relationship with Rich Campiola, who's a, a terrific um, guide in the Keys, grew up in New England, but guides down there, um, who has gone from like, you know, that that relationship is, I think, maybe the most interesting for me in this book, because I've been on both sides of guiding and angling and there is a, there's always a transactional component of guiding. Right. And our friendship, I was just down there a couple of weeks ago fishing with him has gotten so that the friendship side outweighs the transactional side. Like, of course I'm going to pay him because he works his ass off and pulls all day and 20 knot wins like he just did for me two weeks ago. Um, but I love that we can do that. And, and, and it's two days a year. You know, I, those are my two favorite days of the year for fishing. And, um, yes. Yeah, so, so I'd say the book is an exploration of those relationships, oftentimes about like men connecting or trying to connect the things that we say and the things that we don't say. Um, and, and also like exploring obsession and passion and that sort of fine line between the two, uh, in the context of a lot of essays about Maine. There's some hunting essays, like a moose hunt that I went on, some oh, deer hunting. I'm in the middle of this moose hunt one right now, and I need to see what happens. I need to know what Don't tell me, but I need to know what happens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my dad is, my father is, uh, he's a, an incredible hunter. He's, he's, I'm more of an angler. I think I, he would admit that too. Like, I'd love to hunt, but he's more of a hunter. But I think what I've recognized here and in the book is that the, the, the type of hunt, the type of fishing that I do is hunting. You know, it's not like, it's not a numbers thing. It's like a very specific approach. And when you're carp fishing or tarpon fishing or musky fishing, it's you want, hunting. You're looking, it's hunting and you're looking for one individual creature to interact with. Right. Uh -huh. you jump and your day is good. I'm it good. It took me years to figure out that I am not, a, I'm not a fisher. I'm a hunter with yeah. my, with my fishing. It, that's exactly the same. I'm exactly the yeah. same. I would rather yeah. spend all week just hunting one particular fish or sight fishing to that fish or trying to get closer, interact or just connect or yeah. communicate somehow with it rather than catch a bunch of trout. 100%. Yeah. Why is that? Like, why are certain people aligned that way? I don't, I don't actually know, but I'm, I'm the same way for sure. A hundred percent. Um, I don't know if it's, if it's like that singular focus, you know, and I, and I, you, you, I saw your Arapaima. Um, the arapaima yeah. Arapaima, yeah. Uh, and I also saw that photo of the of the branch that's getting in your toe, which I'm still trying to <laughs> get out of my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Uh, I gravitate towards fishing that is like hunting and that is very challenging. It's very difficult. I want to do the most difficult thing. It is not to be able to brag and say, hey, I caught a carp or hey, I caught a permit. Mm -hmm. It's because, you know, I, I like... I, you, you just become so familiar with failure, right? And you keep kind of honing and sharpening and um, and when it lines up, um, it's terrific. I, I have been thinking about this a little bit lately, wondering why I am like that. Because like I said, as I'm getting older, I just, I, I generally find I have fewer people in my life as well. And I, and I spend a lot more time outside, um, especially my daughter's in school now. So I spend a lot of time in the bush. I liken it to intimacy for me mm. and it's dark and very morbid because sometimes whether it's hunting deer or a big fish, it, it's gruesome in a lot of ways, but it is, it is intimacy. And I feel like, 
and I don't know if this is a testament to, you know, my own love and sex life, but like, I don't need a bunch of little guys. I just want that one. You know what I mean? And it's yeah. very, it's just, it's intimate. I cannot find you where you, you mentioned, um, why are we like that? I don't know. Is it intimacy? I mean, I know yourself, you're sensitive. You said that in your yourself that you could be sensitive. I know a lot of guys who are kind of Hunt, so, yeah. hunters who aren't overly sensitive could it also be intimacy what why do you think if we had to break it down psychologically why would we be like that Love and that take question. take take ego out because it's not i'm not talking yeah. to the people who are in it for the ego from the ego stance uh, yeah i have no interest in that you know i have no interest in that conversation about those those folks like I, that's that's their prerogative but like that has I, I had zero interest in that um well, it's a really, it's a really good question. I'm, I'm taking a second to think about it. I think, yeah, I think it is intimacy. It's a kind of commitment as well. There's a commitment to this particular creature, right? If it's, let's say it's the moose hunt, right? Um, yeah, it, it becomes, for me, it also becomes a relationship with the landscape in which you find that thing, right? And in the case of hunting, and I think fish that we want to fish for, they're so tremendously keyed into and sensitive to changes in their environment, right? So what I have to do when I'm tarpon fishing is I have to get this fly into their zone of awareness before they know it's there. I need to move it in a way that it's, it's moving away from them, and it's moving like the natural thing that it's imitating. And they get flies dumped on their fucking head at every turn in the keys, right? So I have to be the one that throws it and tricks this fish that's 60 years old. And has seen 3,000 flies in its lifetime and sees some worm flies every day. And it's like, yeah, no way, man. Like, you got to be kidding. I'm not going to eat that, right? There is a level of intimacy with the creature, but there's also like this, you have to be, um, in a way, I have to kind of take myself out of the equation and, and sort of like, and think about how can I be in this environment in a way that doesn't tip off these creatures that are incredibly owned and have like, their senses are so incredibly sharp to change, especially deer, like deer and moose. Um, they're so attuned to changes in their environment, right? Like they, most of the time they know you're there. And in those rare times they don't know you're there, it feels like magic. It feels like like a dream. Like how does that, how is that buck walking in? I, I, okay, I'm downwind, but how does he not know I'm here? This feels incredible. And it's the same way when you, you finally make the right shot on a tarpon or a carp and the carp tips up and eats it or the tarpon, it's the cross-eyed thing where they do before they eat your fly where they get underneath your fly and you see them rise up and you're like, here it comes, you know? So for me, it's, it's intimacy with the creature, but in maybe more so for me, it's this feeling that I develop with these places that I return to and part of the book um, and the epigraph from the book, which is from a Joy Harjo poem is about return, about, you know, coming back to these places. And um, it's very intimate to go back to these places at different seasons right and to like recognize a particular tree or a particular boulder in a pool right or a particular point where the tarpon will come around on a certain tide that that level of information that level of like connection to place and recognition of the like the specificities of each location mm -hmm. is incredibly intimate and i don't think a lot of people well i don't i shouldn't say that cataloging that information in like over the course of a lifetime feels like such a uh it's like a beautiful bit of work to do right like how do i come back to this place as my life evolves and changes and how do i how do i remain open to the subtleties of it like to the changes even though i'm so familiar right how do i come back in a way that's fresh how do i how can i be successful or what's really hard for me is how can i return and fuck up and not be successful right and still like and still be okay. Yeah. <laughs> I never thought about that, but you're right. The places too. Oh, now my brain, I'm going to be thinking about this after, especially I've got a long solo day. It's hunting season. So I spent a lot of time out there just thinking, is yeah. it the, is it the animal? Cause is it the intimacy with the animal? Because why do I get so relieved when I don't take a shot or I miss a shot or the fish looks at me and tells me to piss off? Is yeah. it is it the fact that it's behind the same tree every time? Is it because there's a rock in my front yard on the Bulkley that I have a relationship with this rock <laughs> in that it yeah. directly impacts how far I go in the river, how I do my cast, how I, whether I go out that day based on the water and how it's reacting around this rock. I mean, I don't yeah. know. 
it it runs deep. It does. And I think, you know, um, that is information that like humans have, have, have like sought for thousands of years that I think we're moving away from, right? Like that intimate acknowledgement of these subtle little things in, in a particular landscape. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And there's something for me, like when I'm in those places and I'm, I'm like truly focused and like present there, it's one of the only times in my life where I'm, I'm just focused on what I'm doing. I'm like, I'm 100% present. Do you know? And you find yourself in your tree stand, you're kind of drifting off or you're thinking about like, oh, should I have to pay my health insurance bill? But you know, those moments when you're so hyper aware, your senses, your senses kick up, your hearing gets a little bit better. Right. And, it, um, uh -huh. it's yeah. med it is the most <laughs> meditative. And I, and I think that's why I do, I do factor in the animal to that moment. Because yes. in that moment, if I'm just in the space, my brain can drift. But if yep. I'm in that moment and it's me and him or me and her or me and whatever, yeah. there is nothing else. And I feel myself become truly human. I mean, in 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 its true form, I'm a I'm an animal in that moment. Yes, exactly. And in some ways, like that animal is a manifestation of that particular place, right? Y like yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then the it's a matter yeah. that's right. And then it's a matter of who's gonna screw up first. Yeah. Is it me or is it you? <laughs> it's just, yeah. Whoever whoever loses here, it's whoever made the mistake. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. So yeah. it's a it's a very polarizing. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for giving me something to think about while I stand behind <laughs> yeah. a tree today. Yeah, you're um, welcome. So the book, did you feel a sense of control uh, or getting control of your life in writing that and putting all those beautiful stories together? Or are was, you now just lost? Are you now more lost than ever? <laughs> um, I don't know if it's about a sense of control. I think for me, it was a process of, uh, it sounds really corny to say, just like get, gaining more perspective and acceptance of who I am and like the, the way that I tick. And also, um, you know, I, I think I... I the the cliche of like the strained relationship between the father and son we've seen that in so many you know stories and works of art etc cetera, etc cetera. and i've had issues with my dad as everyone has but my dad and i are extremely close and part of this exploration is like how do we stay present in those moments that mean so much to us when we know this person is not going to be around very long right and that is the struggle that i have is is like the recognition that um this is very temporary. And like, this sounds like I'm going to go off on some Buddhist tangent, which I'm not, but um, like, I think hunting and being a good hunter requires your presence and your, um, your attention. And the struggle I have is not like this horrible friction with my father. It's, it's like the opposite, you know, it's um, yeah. Like having so much care for someone that it, it's overwhelming. And like, what do you do with that? Yeah. Right. So you put it in words. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is like, it's some representation of it. It's not, it's not everything. Um, yeah. And in a way, I think I, I did write for him. Um, and also for like for my, my future self, when I, my memory starts to fade, I have like those, you know, the images I've been just talking to my students today about images, like the images, like the, when you're reading, right. The, the reading experiences, you're, you're viewing images. That's all reading it. It's just your mind viewing these the story playing out in your head, right? But the image is like it's my memory. It's like the physical detail of the moose. What part are you at the moose story? I don't want to tell you what happens. Where you are guys, you in the moose? You guys have been tearing up, and now you're back with your mate. Um, and the moose is in the middle of the road. Oh, okay. Uh, because I I, I I think well maybe because you I got the PDF so late and I'm oh, I'm yeah. really sorry I feel like I'm doing you a disservice but I yeah, love I'm... I love you right okay tell me what happens <laughs> tell sure, me what yeah. happens totally I had never shot a deer before um I hunted deer pretty regularly since I was like twelve and you asked me about like sensitivity I always thought there was something wrong with me because my dad would shoot a buck every year even when his like hearing started to fade. You know, he can't hear me on the phone, but he can hear like a tree snap at 75 yards. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. um, so I started to internalize not harvesting a deer as like there's something wrong with me or that I was like putting off this energy in this tree stand that the deer were picking up on or something. And I got, you know, um, 
moose hunting in Maine. It's a lottery. And I, my grandfather applied for 22 years and never got it. And, um, and I got it and I did a lot of shooting. I, you know, I, I did a lot of target shooting and I just really wanted to be dialed in because I knew, um, I wanted to kill the animal quickly <laughs> and I didn't want to, you know, um, I didn't want that to be even part of my thought process. I wanted it to be natural. Right. And just when you, when you start thinking you, you're, you're done already. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think what, what, what literally happened was we saw, we came across these two moose that were sparring. It was kind of a mid, it was September. It was a misty morning. It was about seven o'clock in the morning. Everything was kind of covered in dew. It's probably in like the low, low fifties. Um, and like no, not much wind at all. And, uh, the, the moose that were sparring, these two bulls were probably 350 or 400 yards away on this ridge line. And uh, my dad's friend, Sean, um, he used a cow, he, he does his own kind of mouth cow call. And uh, the buck that, I'm sorry, the, the moose, the bull that was uh, victorious in the fight was the one that responded to his call. So he won the fight, but he soon after uh, paid the consequence for that. Um, he started walking down this little logging road and I, I was on my tripod. I, my safety was off. My 308 was like ready to go. The plan was that my father was going to fire right after me if the moose didn't fall. And you know, moose can take a lot of lead. And a lot of the guides would be like, they'll say like, keep shooting until it falls over, right? Because then you have the issue of, of retrieval and, and hauling them out when they weigh a thousand pounds. Um, I was walking dead on towards me. All of a sudden, it just sort of stepped off of the the trail just no reason it didn't seem like it winded us it just disappeared and it was this massive creature and then it was gone and we're all the three of us my dad my, his friend sean and i were standing there like what just happened like what did we do the wind seems okay um and we're sitting there talking and like feeling sorry for ourselves and the thing just pops right back out on the road and it's a little bit closer and i like nothing i, I have no memory of it but i just like dropped to one knee got on the tripod i shot it right in the brisket and um, it didn't do anything. It just stood there. My dad fired and then soon after told me that his scope was foggy and he shouldn't have fired and he didn't, he's not sure if he hit it. And the moose like showed no sign of being hit. And I'm thinking, of course, like I've never had an experience of shooting a large animal at that time. So I thought like, how the fuck do you miss a moose? You know, at like 90 yards, I was feeling terrible about it. He kind of lumbered off in the woods. Um, they're so big in your scope that you you think that they're, um, it, it was actually much farther away than I thought when I shot. So we started looking for it at like 60, 70 yards. Didn't find, there's no blood, there's no hair. I was feeling nauseous, you know, like I wounded this thing or I missed, right? Um, and I walked ahead. My dad and Sean stayed behind looking where they thought the moose was. I went, I just kept walking down the road and I heard it, I heard it breathing. I heard like these raspy oh, exhales. That's it. <laughs> Yeah. And that was like the end of, that was like its last few breaths. I hit it right through the heart. It went 15 feet and tipped over. It was dead by the time I got to it. It was this beautiful creature. The, the coat was like, you know, like just no markings at all. It had this silver tuft of hair on, on its hump. Um, and just like completely slick with, with dew. Uh, it was a very overwhelming moment for sure. Um, and also just there's a surreal moment of like standing over this creature that's a thousand pounds that you've just killed and and sort of the recognition of that of like this is over smooth's life is over like what what do we, what happens now right um that's the next page that you're going to read <laughs> you work like hell is what happens now <laughs> Uh, did did yeah. you ever shoot another moose? Was that your last? I've never taken a moose. Admittedly, I'm just not around in one space long enough to eat a moose. Um, yeah, no, that's fair. But no, have you, did you take another one after that? No, it's the it's the lottery system. I, I have not gotten drawn again. Right. It's like a, I think it's like a, between a seven and eight percent chance of being drawn, something like that. So it's not great. What an experience! Yeah. Well, where, yeah. Where else does the book start to meander? What other stories do I have to look forward to? And do other people have to look forward to? Oh man, I appreciate that. Um, there's a, there's a lot of tarpon stuff. Uh, one of my favorite pieces though, is um, a backcountry fishing trip with my guide and friend, Rich, where it was, it was like too cold for tarpon, even though I really wanted to go for them. And we, um, it was like a plan B type thing. We went in the backcountry 
and um it was like a little bit cold uh the water was really low and we found this spot out in the open where these giant snook were just kind of laying there just kind of like just chilling there was no one around um and we had like an hour and a half of just absolutely incredible fishing at these snook that were almost 40 inches uh and red fish as well and it, it that was the point where <clears throat> i had fished with him for four or five years at that point and i said let me let let me pull for a second and i was i i can i'm much better at pulling now than i was then he's like i don't you don't need to pull like come on the fishing like stay up there like get ready there's another one up there you know like you're gonna catch another one and i had caught like two almost 40 inch snook a couple of red fish in like 45 minutes and i was like this is incredible and he finally let me Oh, and he hadn't been on the pointy end for a really long time mm -hmm. so it was cool that was sort of the moment in that relationship where it was like he trusted me enough to get on the pulling platform of his you know his whip ray and and um <clears throat> and to get that shift in perspective of like watching your guide fish who's like who's now one of your good friends um i love i love that essay and uh yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a lot of um, the sort of evolution of those relationships. And my friend Parker, who I love, um, there's a piece about going up to northern, extreme northern Maine, trying to get him his first muskie, um, which he catches at like 5.30 at night uh, after paddling five miles up current in this like small tributary that used to be a trout stream that now has muskie. Um, yeah, and I, I think what people, I hope what people connect with most is the evolution of the relationships i mean this is not a how-to book this is not a book that um is me like telling you how amazing i am because i caught a tarp and it's really about the relationships that i've developed doing those things yeah i gathered um, that i didn't pick up ego at all in the book oh good that's good yeah and I, so I, I think i i my hope is that people will have that dual experience that we kind of talked about earlier whereas you're reading the book about the moose hunt but you're also simultaneously having an experience of tapping into something that's happened in your in your life so you have this um sort of like dynamic experience of experiencing something that i really really want to share with you but also tapping back into something that's very meaningful for you was there anything that you put in the book or any chapters that you wrote that you later took out oh yeah 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 I honestly like this was my this was my process. I had a bunch of published material from I, I'm a senior contributor at the Drake. So I have a bunch of stuff that Tom published for me. I have some stuff from Gray's Meat Eater that I kind of like revise a little bit. I put all of it in a Word document and it was like, I forget how many pages, a lot of pages. And it wasn't a book. It was just like a dump of all of my, you know, like published work into one space, just this big, massive file. So I had to go through and think about there were a couple of pieces that I really like some of my best writing, I think um, that like did not fit with the narrative that was like showing itself. That was kind of appearing, which was these three relationships, the return to these places, return to Northern Maine, return to my home waters in central Maine, return to the keys and drawing some kind of like interesting, but weird parallels between Maine and Florida, like opposite ends of the of route one, you know, um, and it was a process of, of, I was talking to my students about this today. When you have the ability to kind of zoom out of your work, sometimes you'll see the things that don't belong. And it can be difficult. I wrote a piece about the um, the worm hatch and the keys and, and the way the tarpon respond to that. And I love that piece. That's like one, one of my, the pieces that I'm most proud of, but it has, it has absolutely nothing to do with these characters in the book, like these people that I love. So I had to do the hard work of, um, of removing and like carving right and it's sort of like i think of like a um like a sculpture you have to kind of keep cutting and carving and eventually you'll start to see something right and the more you get rid of that doesn't need to be there the more it kind of becomes itself in a way and that was my experience with it was mostly cutting and then and then reorganizing and thinking about okay there has to be some kind of linear progression of all three of these relationships they all have to, those three relationships my dad parker and rich they all have to evolve in the course of the book and I need to evolve during the course of the book, right? Characters evolve, they change, they want something, they interact with people. Those relationships are not in a vacuum. Those relationships change. They're strained. They're great. They're strained again, that kind of thing. Um, so I was I was mindful of of like being okay with getting rid of stuff that I love that didn't didn't serve the book. 
and also like digging back into these characters and thinking about okay how can i how can i show you someone who's thousands of miles away who pick us, picks up this book what it's like to walk a logging road with my dad when he's 70 and he's put off his knee surgery after till after hunting season and he can barely kind of keep up you know um you have to kind of think about these people you know and love and think about in as few a brush stroke of brush strokes as possible like how can i paint this picture for this other person right um so that was the work of the book getting rid of what didn't belong building up the characters and like thinking about the linear progression of the relationships in a way that um a way that kind of mirrors the way that relationships evolve over time yeah and my relationship to these places that i return to in different states of mind and different you know there's one essay where i was i for a summer i was living in a like a camper behind my dad's house um so I, you'll there there's me at very different phases of my life as well um some of these essays there are some like flashbacks to when i was a boy but I mean, it covers a quite a quite a swath of a time in my life so yeah how did you feel when you put the last full stop in it and the book was done to the best of your ability and you said to yourself for the first time it's done how did you feel yeah i remember that quite well um i mean i think there's a there's a level of terror because what happens is like you have this thing that you're really close to and you there's like these people in here that you really love and then you realize that it's no longer yours like it goes out in the world and then it's like someone else's to experience and then i felt like i felt like the pretty psyched about the accomplishment of like okay i've been in this and working on this for seven years i need some space from it we need to like see other people for a while kind of thing <laughs> and also i also thought of like yeah but fuck but a bunch of people are going to read this now right and it's like is rich going to be pissed at the way i describe him when he's grumpy because my buddy made a bad cast when he was guiding me or like is my dad going to think that I, I wrote him as like a curmudgeon when he's really a really sensitive, sweet guy, right? Or that part, I make fun of Parker because he's really short. Is he going to be upset about that? Like, these are the things that like the sensitive mind thinks of and you're like, fuck, I wish I could just not be sensitive. <laughs> How do I just like not care? How do I care less, you know, which I've never been good at. Um, but it's also, it's also like, there is like a, a level of privilege of just being able to like finish a piece of work and then share it with people, which is kind of an honor. And the thing I talk to my students about is like my goal with any piece of writing is that the person who picks it up will finish it. Like, what can I do as a writer? What tools do I have so that you will not put the book down, right? Because we have a million distractions. We have a million things we could do. Our phone is dinging every 40 seconds. I want to, to the best of my ability, make it very difficult for you to put the story down. I want you to finish the story. Um, did I pull that off? I don't know. But um it's my first book too, right? So it's sort of like, maybe I'll look back at this in 10 years and grimace. Like you look at yourself in the eighth grade with like a bowl cut and you're like, oh my God, that was me. What was I thinking? Maybe I'll look at these stories that way, right? I think but, it's um, inevitable. I think every writer looks back and would change things, but I hope that you see uh, it as, I mean, if you didn't write them now, the memories would just get more blurry as the time goes on. So they had to be put down. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, now is the time, right? Yeah. Well, I love it. And the only reason I put it down was because of our Zoom issue yesterday. So um, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I I need a paper copy. Where can we okay. get copies of the book from? Sure. So it was published by Island Port, one word, Island Port Press, which is a small press in Maine. So you can look at Island Port Press's website. There's also um, an independent bookstore in Maine. If you want to support independent bookstores, it's called Back Cove Books. And you can look them up online and search for the book. It's called Tributaries. And um, it was their best-selling memoir of 2023, which is pretty cool. And they they really kind of championed the book on a local level. So I'm like very appreciative to them. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can go on Amazon if you have no soul, but I would <laughs> rather. <laughs> I was sitting here thinking, will he, will he not? Will yeah. he, will he not? Uh, that was no, I mean, I will. I know you didn't want to, awesome, but. <laughs> Do you sell it direct? Do you have a, web <laughs> a website going right now? Yeah, I have a website, which is my my name, ryanbro.com. Uh, it will link you to um, the bookstore and the publisher to buy it. I don't have, I don't have copies that I sell directly. I wish I did, but I don't. Yeah. Yep, and that's Ryan with a Y and Broad, B-R-O-D. 
exactly. Yeah. Just for people who are wondering. So they don't have to go all the way back to the episode and read the title. So open your phone and buy it. Um, well, it's been an absolute pleasure to finally get to meet you and sit down. Is there, I, I know there's lots to talk about, but for the purpose of today's episode, is there anything that you would like to add? No, I can't, I can't think of anything else. It's, it's a, it's an honor to talk to you. And, um, I've been listening to your podcast for a long time. One of my favorite writers is Aaron Block and, oh, yeah. um, Aaron, yeah, Aaron, uh, I had my, I assigned one of Aaron's essays to my students this semester. She has, if anyone is interested in a short, but beautiful essay, she has this essay called solo, which is about her, um, hunting snowshoe hair in Colorado by herself. Uh, it's an absolutely beautiful essay. Like I get weepy every time I read it. Um, and I, I get to, I got to assign it to my students and then she joined, I mean, I'm in Maine, she's in Colorado, but she joined us via zoom. And I had all of my 12 students come up with a question to ask her. Uh, and we had this lovely conversation. So I was, I really loved your episode with her. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, it's just great to talk to you. And I really appreciate the opportunity to just to chat to like a fellow angler obsessive and, and to talk about the book a little bit. Yeah, well, likewise. And I look forward to hearing how your 40s go. I'm very curious to see which full-time role you end up, <laughs> up taking because you you will be taking one on in the next few years. I'm going to have to, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, don't hang up. I will stop recording. Um, thank you. Let me stop here.